So, hello everyone and welcome to today's Anamed Talk session. I am Yağmur Civan Uyanık and I am the Administrative Assistant at Koç University's Research Center for Anatolian Civilizations, known as Anamed. Thank you for taking time out and being here today for the last talk of this academic year's Anamed Talk series titled Becoming Bursa, the first Ottoman capital revisited. Professor Suna Chaptai will be focusing on the story of the transition from the Byzantine Christian city to an Islamic Ottoman one, posting that Bursa was multi-faith capital where we can see the religious plurality and modernity of the Ottoman world. Our webinar will be focusing on the Professor Chaptai's talk and a conversation about significant question uh, questions with the moderator, Professor Oya Pancaroğlu. A Q&A session will follow. Uh, you are more than welcome to write your questions into the chat box throughout the event. Um, before I leave the floor to today's speakers, Professor Chaptai, who was a senior fellow of ANAMET in the 2018 and 2019 academic year, and Professor Pancaroğlu, a member of the ANAMET advisor board, I would like to briefly introduce them to you. Suna Chaptai is an archaeologist and architectural historian working on late Byzantine, early Ottoman, Crusader, and Principality period. Uh, architecture and urbanism in late medieval Anatolia, in particular the appropriation of Byzantine and Latin architectural techniques and forms in Islamic context and the afterlives of ancient cities. She holds a PhD in architectural history and theory from the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign uh, 2007 and MA in um, 2001 and BA 1998 from Bilkent University Ankara. She is an assistant professor of archaeology and architectural history in the um, Faculty of Architecture and Design at Bahçeşehir University Istanbul. Since 2017 uh, she has been a research associate for Bahçeşehir University um, for, for sorry, uh, the impact of the uh, ancient city, a project based in the Faculty of Classics at the University of Cambridge, funded by the European Research Council. And Oya Pancaroğlu received her PhD in Islamic art and architecture from Harvard University in 2000, and is currently professor in the Department of History, Bolshe University. Her research interests include Islamic architecture in medieval Anatolia, ceramic production in the medieval Persianate world, and figural representation in Islamic art. Lastly, I would like to inform you that the microphones and videos of all attendees are turned off automatically and that this event is being recorded. Have a wonderful webinar. Okay. Uh... Good evening, or maybe good afternoon, or even good morning, depending uh, where you are joining us from uh, today. Um, so I'm very uh, pleased and delighted uh, to be moderating uh, today <laughs> uh, in uh, what uh, I hope will be a kind of uh, uh, less than formal or somewhat informal uh, uh, talk uh, between me and uh, Suna Chaptai uh, over uh, this uh, brand new book uh, that she just published. I guess it's been a few months that it's out, maybe not even quite, uh, 2021. Um, so actually, maybe I should say a little bit, I was thinking about this uh, over the last few days. Uh, Suna and I met uh, all the way back uh, in 2003, uh, while she was uh, still a graduate student, uh, and I was a uh, fairly uh, recent uh, postdoc and we met at a, a conference uh, at her university uh, in Illinois at uh, Urbana Champaign and uh, so that's that conference was uh, appropriately I guess <laughs> for our meeting and both for both of our, our research interests uh, titled Encounters with Islam. Uh, where uh, Suna presented, I guess, what was then kind of preliminary work research uh, that she was doing uh, on the region of Bithynia, including uh, Bursa uh, specifically, um, which then, of course, continued on. Uh, she continued on this uh, to uh, uh, 
produced her uh, PhD thesis uh, on uh, cultural transition in the region of Bithynia uh, in the 14th century, uh, focusing on what architecture has can tell us about that transition, uh, as opposed to uh, what written texts uh, uh, tell us or uh, try to convince us. <laughs> Um, so since then, now uh, we're in uh, 2021, uh, I'm really happy uh, <laughs> to kind of mark this occasion uh, again uh, on a, a topic uh, that has uh, matured over the years. Uh, it's a topic of interest to me uh, as well. Uh, that is how Bursa became an Ottoman capital uh, in the course of the 14th uh, century. Um, so let me show the book again. Maybe I showed it too quickly. There it is. Uh, published uh, by I.B. Torres, uh, for those of you who are interested. Um, <clears throat> so without uh, further ado, I think what we will do is we will uh, get into some questions that uh, have come up uh, in my mind uh, uh, as I read the book um, that uh, I would like to uh, pose to uh, Suna. Uh, but for those of you who uh, come up with questions of your own in the course of listening to us, of me asking questions and uh, Suna uh, answering them. Um, feel free, uh, as Yamur mentioned, uh, to put your question uh, in the chat box. Uh, we will be reserving, as uh, Yamur mentioned, uh, the last half hour uh, to questions, but uh, we may also, uh, in, if there's you know, uh, questions that come uh, directly relevant to our, um, the course, the kind of the flow of the discussion, uh, we're happy to incorporate your questions that way as well. So uh, feel free. Uh, we're not doing a very rigid format uh, uh, webinar here. Uh, so we hope that everybody feels comfortable. Okay, so um, as everybody might imagine, uh, the, the first question for such an event uh, uh, focused on a book, a discussion over a book uh, would be to ask our author, uh, why she, uh, how, she, how and why she decided uh, to write this book. Um, Suna? Thank you, Oya. Um, thank you so much. It, it's, a, it's a great delight for me as well. I'm also honored uh, to be doing this with you. Um, your work, the, the article that you published in 1995 was, uh, was very inspirational for me. One of the articles that I, uh, the first articles that I read on Bursa. Um, so um, I am uh, very honored and delighted uh, 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 to be doing this with you. How uh, the idea of books started. Um, as you said, I worked on uh, 14th century Bithynia. I looked at the cultural transition and I especially focused on the buildings and landscape to uh, comment on that cultural transition from Byzantine to, uh, to the Ottoman. Um, my focus in my dissertation was regional, and I decided to narrow my lens in the book uh, by writing this book. And one of the starting points uh, for me to write this book was uh, um, was my affiliation with the project in Cambridge. Uh, our project is called The uh, Impact of the Ancient City. We look at the afterlives of classical cities. And uh, I just realized when I arrived in Cambridge in 2017, I said to myself, we know a great deal about the afterlife of Bursa, but we don't know much about the, the original city. So I decided to go deep into the, into the textual accounts, uh, talking about the city in the Hellenistic Roman, as well as in the early Byzantine period, because in my dissertation, I mainly focused on the late Byzantine era to the early Ottoman. Um, so, it, the book itself is also part of a larger writing and research project that I want to pursue on the idea of the lost cities, the, describing the idea of urban loss in, in the medieval context, how archaeologists uh, excavate those layers and how we interpret them um, as archaeologists and architectural historians. Um, I am hoping that I'll take this on to, as a, on to a next step by perhaps talking about the Islamization of the Western Anatolian cities um, in the uh, 13th and 15th centuries. Mm -hmm. So this is how the book idea came about. Yeah, I, it's kind of uh, very logical actually. <laughs> Combining actually your background in archeology span uh, with uh, architectural history. Um, and also I think paying attention to, to 
not just the city, but to the you know the 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 kind of the hinterlands or the regions uh, in which these cities uh, are located. Uh, so maybe I, I, one of the questions that I have, because your thesis was on, of course, uh, the broader region of Bithynia. Um, so I wondered what you think uh, about, like when you think of Bursa or, or Prusa, <laughs> the, the Byzantine and the, Ro the earlier Roman city, its place, its role in that region. Um, and uh, when we come to the Ottoman after the Ottoman conquest, like, th is there a change in its kind of role within its region, within uh, or in its function? Um, does it grow? Uh, the, are there continuities or disruptions? Uh, how does it work within that uh, region? I think in order to do that, I need to uh, share my screen and start talking sure. with my slides. So uh, please allow me to do that. I'm not sure whether you're able to see the screen. Uh, I think it's, it looks fine to me. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Hold on, let me also um, turn on the laser. Yeah. Okay, um, I mean, let's first begin with the city itself. And I would like to begin with this image, which you see on the screen and watercolor painting of the city in that's done in 1827, uh, showing the city from the region of Kukurtl, uh, Western uh, district within the city, looking into the old city over here. In a way, this is uh, one of the things that I argue in the book is the fact that, you know, Bursa remains uh, a very Byzantine looking or hybrid city in its architectural culture and landscapes up until the 1855 when the, the earthquake hits the city and demolishes uh, much of its urban fabric. So I look at the city from that perspective and uh, you know this is a city that's uh, praised for its um, fine bazaars, wide streets, um, gardens and running springs by Ibn Battuta who visited the city in 1331. Another traveler compared the city to Granada because of its beautiful luscious landscape. The city itself suffered a 10 year siege. Um, people suffered, some of them fled to Constantinople and city was uh, eventually surrendered uh, to the Ottomans. And Ashik Pashazade, our favorite historian of the period, uh, he underlines the fact, he emphasizes this uh, 10 year siege and he says the conquest was simply um, was not possible uh, by the by laying a siege. Um, we just require some sort of a patience in order to get into the city. So this was a city that the Ottomans dreamed about uh, for about 10 years. And within the city and also within the region, there are several continuities that I discuss in the book. One of them is the continuity that we see in the royal bathing complexes, how uh, the baths that are dated to the Roman and the Byzantine periods were reused by the Ottomans. Um, and they were mainly located in the Western part of the city known as Chekirge and also this area uh, where Levenian did his painting Kukurtlu. Um, and those bathhouses were known in the Byzantine times as a favorite spot uh, for the Byzantine emperors and their wives on their way to visit um, Mount Olympus where the monastic complexes were. Uh, situated. Um, the continuity is also seen on the Holy Mountain, the Mount Olympus, where it functioned as a refuge for both, uh, both for Byzantines and the Ottomans. Um, it was um, a favorite spot uh, during the iconoclastic period for the monks uh, uh, escaping from Constantinople. And it also became a favorite spot. It also sort of uh, shifted its function from being the mountain of Keshish or Christian monks to one of Dervish uh, or Muslim Sufi saints. So there is another continuity there as well. Um, one traveler, for example, talks about um, in 1588, um, his name is Lubanu. Um, he says that he attended a mass uh, with the Greek monks on a monastic church on Mount Olympus. And um, 
he also talks about uh, shrines that are dedicated to the Muslim saints. So uh, we see uh, uh, religious overlaps uh, taking place uh, on the Holy Mountain as well. One more continuity was in the urban fabric of the city as well as the region, spoliation of the Byzantine buildings had to function as mausolea or a palace or, um, or churches. Um, the, the Ottomans also used city walls and the, and the gates. Again, this image on the screen is a very telling one because it shows you the hybrid outlook that I talked about earlier. You see the city walls behind it. There is a Greek Orthodox church um, and the remains of the palace. Um, and there is an early Ottoman building known as the Shehadet Mosque over here. And then uh, the, this is the Acropolis of the city. And then you see uh, on the plain other uh, buildings that are constructed in the um, early Ottoman period, such as the um, Orhan's um, convent masjid over here in the lower city and the Kozahan right here. And this is the, the continuity and the spoliation of the past uh, took place in the heart of the city, that is the Acropolis surrounded by walls and the gates. And it also had this um, um, east to west running street known as the Decumanus uh, Maximus Street um, following the grid plan. So this is one of the continuities and the reuses as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, um, so these are the things that we talk about. And when the Ottomans decided to build a new, uh, they basically followed the local Byzantine uh, construction practices, something that's especially apparent in the Mosque of Orhan, some to which we will uh, we'll return, I think, again later. So I won't talk much, uh, but I'll just give you the detail that there was a continuity in the construction practices and perhaps the builders, local builders were responsible in that continuity. Uh, okay, uh, those uh, early 19th century <laughs> city views are just amazing, uh, mm -hmm. considering especially uh, that, uh, um, that Bursa suffered a major earthquake. Uh, yes. in 1855 right yeah um so um just out of curiosity like how does um how does prusa byzantine prusa compare say in the 13th century or 12th century you know in this sort of the mid to late medieval period with like nicaea um and, and because these are both cities in the region conquered by the ottomans so what what you know I, I, we always think of Nicaea as a major city mm -hmm. and yet it was Prusa that the Ottomans chose to make their capital but yeah what was think, it there that that you think prompted them in that direction yeah. um I think when we compare the legacy of Nicaea with Prusa in the 12th or 13th centuries or in the late Byzantine period I think the legacy of Nicaea is stronger and the reason that the Ottomans um, decided to um, choose um, uh, Bursa as a capital city because it uh, it was conquered before uh, before Nicaea. Mm -hmm. If they conquered Nicaea before Bursa, they would have uh, chosen um, Nicaea as their capital city. Um, um, Nicaea, uh, throughout its history, starting from the uh, Hellenistic and classical period, um, its um, legacy, its urban fabric, its um, architectural language, everything super surpassed uh, that of uh, that of Bursa and also most of the cities in Bithynia as well. Mm -hmm. um, it was an important metropolis in the classical period. Um, it was a very important early uh, Christian and Byzantine city and it was also, also the capital city of the Nicene Empire. Um, so its legacy was way stronger than that of uh, that of Bursa. But I think both cities, in a way, because of their landscape, because of geographical horizon, they shared uh, some some similarities. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, Nicaea is also a very good case of urban archaeology as well. I mean, you walk through the streets, you get a sense of the, you know, classical fabric as well as the Byzantine layers and the Ottoman uh, layers as well. Right. Um, one thing I really like about your book is, is I mean, of course, as it attempts to kind of uh, lay out the, the, the course of transition, it, uh, you pay quite a bit of attention in the beginning to 
although there isn't a huge amount known, but whatever is known about uh, pre-Ottoman Bursa going back to uh, the Roman period. And uh, you uh, quote from a, a Roman, um, uh, I guess a, a major figure in the city in the, is it in the third century or earlier? Um, uh, second know, century AD. Yeah. Second century, okay. Yeah. Uh, and he talks about, you know, this kind of ideal of uh, kind of, you know, I guess with city pride uh, that, that uh, he thinks that there should be, you know, harbors and shipyards. So it, it, in a way, you know, maybe one difference between Prusa and Nicaea, uh, and maybe one that the Ottomans wanted to capitalize on was the proximity of Bursa to the sea, uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to, well, I guess they're both I haven't <laughs> measured <laughs> what the distances are, uh, but somehow from Bursa, it's kind of, you know, the plains and you're almost there. Uh, yes. But also from, from that quote of Dio, uh, uh, and also the quote we give from Pliny, uh, this kind of, they mentioned it, they're talking about Prusa, right? Mm -hmm. Roman or uh, uh, Roman uh, Prusa, and uh, they're talking about shipyards, harbors, uh, uh, they're talking about, uh, you know, uh, baths mm -hmm. uh, and bathing and spas. So, uh, which yeah. is, they're talking about areas really kind of beyond the walled city proper of Prusa. So, mm -hmm. um, so it, it suggests a, a different perception of the city than the one that we maybe get hung up on, <laughs> yeah. which is, you know, uh, seeing the city as the walled entity. Uh, would, is, if you have thoughts on that, I wonder sure. if we could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I think often when we think about cities um, and when we study walled towns and cities, we often think that all the urban activities happened within the walls. There was nothing else going on outside the walls. There is some sort of a, you know, uh, we have to understand that the walls were important, uh, claiming a civic identity in the classical period. This is how the cities defined their territory and so on. Um, this is also the place where they um, constructed the most important public buildings and religious buildings and marketplaces as well. But there was all, always a lower town and the suburb where the agricultural act activities took place, subsidiary religious um, 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 buildings were also constructed. So I think when we are studying ancient cities, we have to always understand that there was a city beyond, beyond the walls. And for example, um, uh, if we remember Aristotle's uh, words on how he understood um, how he defined the perfect city in the, four, in the ancient Greek period. He says that the city should be situated on a sloping ground with an easy access to the sea, the land and the territory and the sufficient supply of good water. So in the case of Bursa, many of those elements sort of meet uh, what Aristotle is telling us. Um, but you know, some of the things are not there. For example, the, you know, the proximity of Bursa to the sea. Nicomedia, when you compare it Bursa with other Bithynian cities is way closer. And I think Nicaea and uh, Bursa are equally away from the, from the sea as you, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So it almost requires like a day trip mm -hmm. or a whole day, uh, day's journey. But what is significant about Bursa, I think it's good water resources and the fertile plan mm -hmm. that um, a good city needs. And it has those two major features. Although it's away from the sea, you cannot really access to the land at the back where the mountain is, uh, but you, they had a very wide open uh, uh, plain and, uh, and also uh, really good sources. And when we compare Nicaea, Nicomedia, and Bursa, I just want to show this uh, um, uh, 13th century map uh, that's done on a Roman model, um, showing the cities of Nicomedia over here, Nicaea, and Bursa. And if you, I'm not sure whether you are able to see the details, but both Nicomedia and Nicaea, they have an enclosure and mm -hmm. buildings inside that enclosure. In the case of Bursa, it's only two thatched roofs. So this also shows in the um, early Roman period or imperial period, um, perhaps it wasn't that significant as a city, 
Uh, but then later on, I think in the Byzantine period with the rise of the monastic foundations and the rise of the bathing complexes, it, it sort of picks up uh, and tr tries to, you know, get on the same level with, uh, with Nicaea and Nicomedia. And mm -hmm. of course, Bursa was lucky, as you mentioned, because it had Dio. Uh, mm -hmm. Nicaea didn't have a Dio. Um, mm -hmm. And Nicomedia had other, other historians, but none of them were from Nicomedia mm -hmm. uh, talking about the city. And uh, Dio is sort of, um, you know, he's very, um, what in one of his introductions to uh, his talks to the city council, he says, nothing is sweeter than one's native land mm -hmm. in order to promote his, you know, construction activities within the city. This is how he kicks off his talk. So I think, you know, it was, um, a city um, whose um, uh, fortune was very much uh, shaped uh, by the local figures like Dio and also people like uh, you know Pliny the Younger who was the governor of the city. Um, and they were both um, in Bursa around the same time. So it's a very nice coincidence as well. And again, you know, archeologically speaking, the epigraphic evidence, they all uh, stand for ev the evidence that Prusa uh, sort of had a lesser importance. For example, it's uh, assembly, it's city council had 100 members in Nicomedia and Nicaea, we have 300 or 400, something like that. But city equally had people like, you know, people working uh, for the tax collection, organizing uh, sports events um, and public events and so on. They, uh, Bursa had all, all those officials as well. And the, the epigraphic evidence that we see in the uh, in the uh, in the collection um, at the Bursa Archaeological Museum. Mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't say it was a very big important city, uh, but those figures, both Dio as a local figure and Pliny as an important figure, they all uh, they both tried to um, raise the profile of um, raise the profile of Bursa as a as a Roman city. Mm -hmm by promoting new construction activities like the construction of a colonnade, um, bathhouses, uh, renewing the temples and, and so on. Yeah, so I guess it, by the time we get to the Ottoman takeover of the city, there is, uh, in, in the case of Prusa, there's kind of a, uh, I mean, I don't know if we could comment on infrastructure, but, but a kind of a, a notion of the potential of Prusa, or maybe the actual uh, uh, potential, uh, uh, which is perhaps what might explain uh, this kind of expansive view of the city plus all of these assets, uh, the, the thermal waters, uh, the very fertile agricultural land, the relative proximity of the sea. Uh, so when we look at you know, what the Ottomans did almost immediately, after the takeover is to ex to what seems to us as an expansion of the city because of their construction mm -hmm. projects. Uh, but uh, when you, I think a lot of times when we think of this Ottoman expansion, we just think from the, you know, that point in the 1330s or 1340s when all of this starts. Uh, but, you know, if we take ourselves back uh, to, to the Byzantine period, uh, how this expansion, is it really an expansion or is it something else? Yeah. Uh, what would yeah. you say? Again, uh, again, the question of seeing whether the walled city was everything that the late Byzantine city of Bursa had. And this was one of the questions that I discussed as well, as you rightly pointed out. Um, um, again, you know, uh, we, we do have evidence both in the, within the city walls um, for the, you know, really fascinating range of architectural remains, just like the, the mosaic floor that I'm showing you here, that's found within the old city, Helios, uh, so surrounded by the signs of the Zodiac, probably a late antique villa. And uh, the museum also did salvage excavations, uh, revealing us uh, early Christian basilica, perhaps dating to the sixth century. And next to it, they also found another villa with mosaic floors and a hypocaust tiled uh, bathroom or a bathing room. So within the old city walls, uh, there is a very good evidence for um, early Christian Byzantine layers. And also outside the city walls, this is the old city of Bursa, numbered three. 
I discussed that the area one, uh, something that we note in the writings of Dio, as well as in Pliny, and also uh, through some travelers. This was because of the, uh, this area was um, um, rich in terms of its uh, therapeutic waters and thermal waters. Um, this was the area where the, where the royal baths were constructed as well. Um, the bath complex today we know as the old bath or the Eski Kaplija. Um, um, and Dio claims that he has a row of workshops. This is a, you know, a neighborhood within the city. Um, uh, there's also a debate about the construction of a symmetry um, or reconstruction of a symmetry in that area. So we can say that, you know, prior to the conquest of the Ottomans, there was some sort of a suburban establishment there um, surrounded uh, by uh, surrounding the bath complexes, bathing complexes and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and one more detail, um, in the lower city where I note in number four, um, again, um, this is the area that Orhan chose as, it's, as the focus of his lower city. Um, in, the, in the aftermath of the 1958 fire, um, a team of archeologists worked there uh, in order to clean up the, and assess the level of uh, destruction caused by the fire. And they found a small uh, uh, necropolis there. Uh, um, and they also found out that the alignment of the streets predating the constructions done by Orhan and Bayezid I, this is the area where we have uh, Ulu Jami. We have the Ulu Jami by Bayezid I, as well as the convent masjid of uh, Orhan. The, the foundations that are coming underneath um, those um, um, buildings um, were in a way um, redirecting uh, what had came afterwards uh, in the Ottoman period. So Ottomans were basically following uh, the pre-existing street alignment and foundations in the area. Um, this might be a hearsay. This is something that I read and heard from other people. I have never read it in in a report or I have never seen any photos, uh, but I think it's, a, it's just a very fascinating detail to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. One last detail that would tell us that there was some sort of a life um, outside the city walls um, prior to the Ottoman conquest is the area of Yildirim over here, um, number seven. Again, we know that when um, Yildirim Bezat first decides uh, to build his complex over here, um, he uh, gets a donation um, of a land that's already listed in Orhan's Vakfiye, and it's uh, listed as a Kushteri Bahce, um, signifying some sort of a landscaped agricultural plot. And, and I, again, I think you know this is this would be a way for us to see perhaps this part of the city was also sort of inhabited, inhabited in that period as well. Again, you know, it's very specu spe lots of speculation, perhaps mm. no firm ground uh, to support my arguments here. But I think, you know, with the help of urban archeology, span we might be able to find something. Um, uh, but at this point, I think, yeah, our evidence is limited, but um, I would just say, you know, we shouldn't limit ourselves. Um, ourselves um, in order to understand what kind of a city uh, um, Bursa was prior to the conquest of the, con uh, of the, of the Ottomans. Mm -hmm. We uh, actually got a question in the meanwhile uh, from Amy Singer, so I sure. thought I might uh, uh, interject here uh, because it's uh, relevant to the discussion. Uh, she's asking, uh, comparing uh, Bursa with Iznik or uh, Izmit, uh, the, the question of the defensive uh, the natural defensive uh, yes. uh, mountain feature, uh, and to what extent she says she says to what extent do you think that was part of the Ottomans' considerations given the instability of the 13th century, um, um, or maybe early 13th century? She says I don't know. If she means 13th or 14th. <laughs> it's always <laughs> instable. So, um, what 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 do you think about that? The, sure. the um, I think it was a very appealing point. It must have been an appealing idea for the Ottomans to see a city that's uh, built on top of a natural rock. Mm -hmm. And it's already, it has a very good defensive quality on its own and it's surrounded by walls. And on the Southern side of the 
city walls where there's like an easier access to the city, there is a second line of the walls and probably mm -hmm. they were built in the Byzantine period. So that's how I, how I see it. And I think the defensive quality of the, of the city itself, um, yes, it was an appealing uh, feature mm -hmm. for the yeah. Ottomans. Which is then interesting, considering they <laughs> they were very quick to expand <laughs> out yeah. to non-walled areas. Uh, uh, makes you think, or they just did that to, to yeah. confuse us, probably. <laughs> um, so you mentioned this kind of, you know, you said it's speculative, but there is some evidence, uh, minimal as it is, uh, for uh, pre, uh, pre-Ottoman Bursa outside of the walls. So. Uh, um, do you think that, that, that you know, if, if uh, archaeology was uh, kind of the way to go, uh, that, that uh, where do you think, like, uh, where do you think kind of uh, archaeological attention should be focused to, to figure this out? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a very good question, um, since, you know, um, I have this uh, bug inside me. Um, uh, I mean, I, I did the, uh, some sort of a GPR work um, in the old city. Um, for example, one of the areas that I wanted to cover in my survey was the area in around, around the Shahadet Mosque and inside the Shahadet Mosque. I wasn't given a permit. I was only given a permit to cover the northern tip of the castle where we have the tombs, the military guest house probably occupying where the area of the palace was and also the fourth, uh, the, the 17th century palace complex uh, that was built by Mehmet IV. So I was able to cover that area. Um, if I was given a permit to cover in and around the Shehadet, uh, for example, you know, we would perhaps we would have been able to understand what kind of an original plan or what kind of a surrounding that the mosque might have had in the early Ottoman uh, um, context, um, we're at the first context. Um, and I think, you know, um, a survey in the area of uh, Old Bath would be also very good um, in terms of understanding the relationship of the Old Bath complex with the complex of Murat the first, and also the complex itself uh, to understand what kind of an archeological layering uh, there is around. Mm -hmm. And, and what about the monasteries? I mean, this kind of, there is this monastic landscape, as you mentioned, going back to the yes. uh, uh, period of the iconoclasm or maybe even uh, earlier. Uh, um, so I, I think uh, you mentioned that the only one we know for sure is the one uh, within the walled city. Yeah. Uh, but what, what else was there that uh, we, uh, with the little information that we have, uh, sure. but, what I mean, kind of a picture can we have of the monastic landscape? Yeah. Um, when we look at the sources, um, there, it, it, it mentioned they, those sources mentioned that there were uh, four monastic complexes in the city of Pursa. This is how they define it. And um, uh, one of them is Prodromos. There is another one called Hexapitergos and Kavalos and the Grand Monastery. Um, the the Old city itself is not very big, and I don't think it would be big enough to accommodate all those four monasteries with their mm -hmm. subsidiary structures. Sure. But I think for sure, um, I would say that the monastery of Prodromos, uh, where um, the place where the Ottomans the, decided to reuse in order to, uh, they, they turned the complex into tombs for the founders of the Ottoman state, Osman and Ohan. Um, what was the one that's located in the in the old city, and um, one of the really um, uh, important districts within Bursa, I think, um, in its later Ottoman history in the 18th and 19th centuries, is Muradiye. Uh, most of the post Byzantine churches are located in those areas, um, in in that district. And I think, you know, this would be the places for us to look for the remains of the monastic complexes. So I'm assuming, you know, they are either, uh, at least Prodromos is located within the old city and the other three would be situated just outside and Radi is situated right here, number two. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in that area. 
Yeah, actually, uh, Amy Singer uh, uh, made another comment, uh, sure. I think relevant to what you just uh, uh, discussed, that uh, she said it's interesting to, to compare um, Yildirim's choice to build far outside the walls also in Edirne, where mm -hmm. it was on a documented uh, previously Christian site. So um, that that is another, I guess, element that needs to be factored in. To, yeah you know, these uh, uh, projects, uh, yeah. what kind of, you know, projects, how, what prompted them or what triggered them maybe? Yeah. Because in, you know, in a mon monastic environment, the monasteries have really big agricultural plots and land holdings. In the case of Bursa, where there is like a big, big mountain at the back and the monastic complexes, and you have a big plain, uh, chances are you'll have your land holdings, your monastic plots, or your agricultural areas um, on, on the plain. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, if you're talking about a bache that's um, part of Orhan's Vakfiye, um, again, it would be very likely to have a pre-Orhan or pre-Ottoman roots mm -hmm. in the city, uh, because we are talking about a major monastic um, environment um, thriving on the mountains and also in the city. Right. Okay, so let's uh, move on uh, yeah. to, to the actual transition <laughs> uh, and uh, the first uh, kind of inter uh, Ottoman interventions uh, in uh, what became their uh, capital. Um, uh, so we have these con initially conversion projects under Orhan, uh, who is the one who takes the city. Um, and uh, you've done quite a bit of work actually on this, <laughs> the conversion question. <laughs> uh, so you can you can talk about that. But one of the things I want to ask about that, because I, as you will probably explain, this kind of funerary aspect to these, seemingly to these uh, conversions. Like, uh, do you think that the, the, the funerary aspect was the kind of the primary consideration, you know, tra transferring Osman's remains uh, here, uh, you know, reburying him, etc., cetera, um, together with conversion uh, of existing uh, buildings. Uh, and if, if that was a primary concern, would you say that maybe that's kind of um, inspired or modeled somehow on maybe you know, the example, it doesn't have to be the only example, but I think of the example of Konya uh, mm -hmm. and the dynastic, uh, the funerary aspect of the royal mosque uh, in Konya, um, uh, starting in the late 12th century. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think there is a Seljuk element there, you are right, I agree. Um, the Seljuks uh, had this practice of uh, transferring um, the, the burials from the cities, from the other cities into Konya. So what um, um, Orhan did for his father, uh, who died in Soyut or Bilejik um, in 1324, prior to the conquest of the city. And we also read in Ashik Pashazade about the idea of the silver domed uh, building or silver domed uh, structure. Um, so in a way, um, we see this uh, construction of identity displaying a funerary um, function. Uh, turning a Christian building um, to function as a mausolea. I'll just uh, try to uh, find the slide for that. Uh, for example, this one, uh, Levenyan, 1827, showing us uh, the Church of Prodromos turned into um, the mausolea for Osman and Orhan uh, from the area of Iftade. And then, you know, other travelers' depictions, um, we may say that, you know, um, they decided to turn the baptistry of the building, which you see in this Koval's depiction, 1675, for Osman. And in the main part of the church, um, um, Orhan was laid to rest. And in, in between the two, there was an area for praying. And this is what I claim uh, to be the first uh, Friday mosque uh, um, spoliated by Orhan in the old city uh, from the, the uh, main church of the uh, uh, monastery of Prodromos. Um, so there, there was this funerary element and you know it was in a way uh, combined with the sacred qualities and uh, the fact that you know this was dedicated to a Christian saint now it's functioning for the Ottomans 
um, it's just emphasized the continuity from the uh, from the Byzantine to, into the Ottoman. And the building was also we know again in the chronicles uh, that it was it contained several gifts from the Seljuk court, like the drums, rosary beads, and and so on. And this is why the building complex was sometimes uh, known as the double uh, monastery, the drum monastery, and so on. And uh, the way that the Ottomans decided to reuse this complex, I think it just differs from the other examples that are mentioned in the accounts like Danish Mantname, where we read that they wanted to destroy in order to come up with their own buildings. Um, here in this case, um, we are looking at a very uh, uh, practical and symbolic way of uh, reusing. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, and Orhan, of course, uh, very quickly, uh, uh, it's kind of uh, the, the kind of second aspect of Orhan's uh, uh, contribution or impact on, on Bursa is uh, the, the development outside the walls. Uh, mm -hmm. So just uh, to the north of the walled uh, city. Um, and actually, we had a, a question a little while ago from uh, Uzlam Eran. Uh, mm -hmm. She wanted to know, uh, maybe you can also comment on this, because it kind of relates to my question as well. She was asking, was there a significant trade activity, especially silk, uh, in the place of Kozahan before Kozahan was built? What do we know about it? So uh, it's, of course, Orhan who kind of uh, plants the seed the commercial seed <laughs> mm -hmm. here for the Ottomans, uh, although the, it's a valid question. Was there a kind of a, a commercial aspect? Do we know anything from the Byzantine sources uh, of this or and combine that with, you know, why, you know, why does he immediately build? He's already got a converted church as a yeah. mosque, you know, um, uh, presumably he's building some kind of a palace uh, there, um, but uh, very quickly we see him, uh, you know, initiating this project mm -hmm. uh, and building a complex uh, that includes a commercial element. Yeah. Um, what makes one thing, you know, was the commercial thing, you know, really the primary uh, impetus here uh, mm -hmm. or was, or is that somehow maybe misreading the situation? What do you think? Um. To, yeah, to start with this um, idea of um, a th starting a commerce and a trade activities, um, the Byzantine sources, they don't make too many references to Bursa mm -hmm. in the late Byzantine period. Nicaea and uh, the silk production in Nicaea, uh, we get references about that, but there is no mention of, of Bursa as far as I was able to see. Um, uh, but the reason that for Orhan, I think, to move from the upper city, um, move beyond the upper city and go down to the lower city and start a new sort of complex and a new district, um, I see it as uh, almost like um, Orhan decided to keep the upper city as the sacred node of his um, imperial beginning or stately beginning, I would say, or kingship or his identity, kingly identity, um, because this was the area that was taken uh, uh, over. And it was, as you said, it was, it contained the buildings that were reused and uh, the buildings sort of claimed a sacred identity, a transitional identity. And what he wanted to achieve uh, by constructing his own kulia in the lower city with the convent masjid in the middle and surrounded by other buildings of which none of them survive today, um, um, unfortunately. Um, he decided to start um, perhaps a new, um, more civic, more social and public note um, and also a, a commercial life as well. And again, uh, our, as I said, our evidence is limited in terms of how Bursa um, plays a role in the commerce of the late Byzantine period. Uh, but, you know, um, this was the impetus perhaps behind um, Orhan to switch from a sacred node or symbolically framing the upper city uh, by surrounding, by uh, founding another district mm -hmm. in, in the lower city, uh, functioning as a for the public and social purposes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
you know, we have this, uh, you also uh, mentioned in your book, but it's mentioned very frequently about uh, Orhan. It, uh, it's it's a, a comment that comes from a much later source, Nishri. Yes. And he paints this picture of, you know, the, the, the wild west, <laughs> the really dangerous area outside of the city where Orhan built and Orhan completely transformed it. And uh, now it was safe and thriving. And so, you know, I mean, as I read your book, <laughs> or especially the beginning parts of your book, I was like, huh, I'm going to take Nishri's the comment with a larger grain of salt <laughs> yes. uh, that I thought maybe it's really in hindsight he's trying to make Orhan look you know um, something like a savior uh, mm -hmm. uh, coming to the city uh, whereas uh, Orhan might have had much more uh, yes. practical things that and building on existing uh, kind of dynamics uh, as well yeah yeah there is this quotation by Nishri I just put the one in uh, tr uh, the translated mm. version over here. And mm -hmm. it just, you know, he just refers to the idea that the area was uninhabited and it was so barren that no one wanted to go there. Uh, but, you know, Orhan created this new vibrant neighborhood. Um, again, if we remember what the archeologists had found in the 19, early 1960s, like uh, in the 1958, um, but again, archaeologically speaking, there is a big gap between uh, the Roman period and, and the Byzantine as well as the early Ottoman period. Mm -hmm. um, we might be able to say that, you know, um, perhaps there were some remains, but maybe the district was not that vibrant. But the reason that he moved just outside of the walled city, very closer to the, you know, um, the upper city or the walled town, uh, it just shows that he just wants to be near. Uh, to this uh, sacred and more important um, mm. um, area. And, uh, you know, uh, one of the theories that the uh, Guru Nejipol, um uses in order to, for us to understand the, how the convent messages uh, functioned, um, how they were surrounded by subsidiary structures fulfilling, you know, public and social functions and creating a humbler version of the ones in like uh, Tabriz and Sultania. Mm -hmm. um, the one in Bursa with Orhan, as well as with the other sultans, I think they are sort of trying that. And um, they also try to uh, accommodate uh, to the needs of different groups of people, I think. Because, you know, in the upper city, you go and visit the tombs, perhaps, or you pray in the uh, converted mosque if you want to. But if you come to the lower city, uh, you are surrounded by different uh, political actors or cultural actors, the Ahis, the Dervishes and Fakis and, and so on. So I think in a way, or, you know, Madrasa teachers. Um, so they, they were trying to accommodate to the needs of different groups of people, different actors and different mentalities as well. I think around the, in the time of Orhan, there were two different versions of Bursa. Mm -hmm. One sacred in the upper city and another one just mm -hmm. nearby, uh, mm -hmm. uh, culturally and uh, also uh, publicly functioning. Right. So now that yeah, you have the slide up here, yeah. <laughs> can you tell us uh, a little bit more about the, the, the so-called convent mischief, this building, the number one uh, that uh, viewers can see uh, on the slide? Um, it, it's, it seems like a, a milestone building, uh, especially for Bursa, uh, because uh, it's, it's the first in a long series uh, of such buildings uh, going on for a couple of centuries, if not more. Um, but uh, in your book, you actually discuss it's uh, kind of uh, uh, Ottoman, but especially non-Ottoman precedent, mm -hmm. uh, this kind of Mediterranean connection. Uh, I wondered if you could... Uh, Kind of open that up a little bit, uh, sure. the that build, building typology, especially. Yeah, um, there is uh, for the. I mean, this is a very big topic, and I don't know where to begin. But there is a lot of scholarship uh, written on the identification of this building, its origins, um, and how he travels, uh, how it tra travels from one one court to another, and how it functions within the medieval Anatolian context as well. Uh, we see them in the later Seljuk context, Mongol Ilhanid context. One scholar said that Emir, um, he studied those buildings within the context of um, 
uh, Mongol Ilhanid establishments in, in Tokat. And he makes a link between the ones in Tokat um, and, uh, and the ones in, in Bithynia. And um, in the case of Orhan, we have two earlier examples from Bithynia, one from Bilecik, another from Nicaea or Iznik. And this comes as a third one. Um, it's an interesting building. I mean, most of the scholarship um, 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 written about the medieval Anatolia and inverted P um, uh, sort of uh, support this idea of the plan originating in the medieval Anatolian context in the, you know, places like Jajabe, Medrese, and then um, in the, within the Tokat context as well. And it just, it, perhaps it was a plan that was introduced by the uh, Mongol Ilhanid figures into Anatolia and so on. Um, instead of just focusing on that, um, I decided to have a broader uh, look at the plan. Um, and I just skimmed uh, the building plans that we label and identify as throne halls or the audience halls in the Islamic architecture, starting from the Abbasids all the way ending up with the Ottomans and the Mamluks. And I try not to be too typological in my research, but I mainly uh, skim the buildings that uh, uh, have a main room, uh, in most of the cases, a domed main room, uh, surrounded or flanked by two side rooms on either side. Um, so, you know, the plans like Al-Hiri or um, uh, Ayyubid um, uh, Ka plans or Majlis halls or Mamluk Durka Ivans and so on. These were the bu buildings that I used. And I said, you know, um, this plan, and this is something we also see in the Middle Byzantine um, architecture in, in, in Cappadocia as well. So it's something that we note in, in Byzantine architecture as well how this building functions as a throne hall or an audience hall, um, and then travels from one court to another in order to serve to the needs of the kingly propaganda and uh, visibility. Um, so I just, you know, it's an attempt. I'm not sure whether it's gonna be received well. I have no idea, uh, but I just tried. Um, I think it would be much better for us to give it a wider reading of, of the plan. Because later on, I think um, some other scholars like Zeynep Oz, I think she has been working on it. She has been dealing with the residential and the palatial characteristics of those buildings in the, um, during the time of, you know, the Bayezid the first, uh, Mehmet the first and Murat the second. So I think there is this new way of looking at those buildings, not only as the masjids, for praying or convents for dervishes, but also the, the places uh, for the kingly presence and visibility where the sultans, rulers, or uh, notable figures uh, accepted their guests and um, in the main room um, and the side rooms were used for other purposes. Right. The portico is, as I think you mentioned, uh, is possibly uh, related to the exonarthex uh, yes. feature of, of Byzantine uh, church architecture. So I, if that is the case, uh, combined with this kind of broad horizon from you know, Cappadocia to uh, uh, Syria to <laughs> Egypt, uh, you get yes. uh, you know, a, a building that reflects a, a kind of a mature way of thinking about hybridity. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, well integrated. It doesn't look, you know, stuck on uh, the mm -hmm. portico. Yeah, as you mentioned, it it, it features uh, different types of arches. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this kind of hybridity is already. I mean, it's not. It doesn't even seem experimental to me, at least. Uh, that, that something's already been figured out here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so maybe we're just missing those links uh, where there is more kind of experimentation. Um, yeah. before you get to a building like uh, the um, Orhan's uh, convent masjid here. Yeah, I think, I mean, as you said, it's, I find it very conscious as well, the way that um, we can um, detect different uh, workshops. For example, you know, the exonartex itself might look like a Byzantine feature, but the way that it was done, uh, the arches that you see over here, 
they actually follow the outlook of, of a Memluk example that Baha Tanman has discussed. So mm -hmm. the construction wise, you see the alternating brick and stone recessed arches and uh, decorated uh, fills in between the spandrels. But when you look at the front facade, you see another Byzantine detail like this, but then the arches themselves with their tooth uh, patterns as well as zigzags and so on. Uh, these are the features that we find. I think I do have an image for that. Find in, in, in an example like this, Abu Huraira tomb in, in Yumna, 1274. Mm -hmm. um, it just, you know, looks almost identical with the exception of the um, incised arches that you see um, on either side of the main uh, zigzag arch over mm -hmm. here. But then you just go back and you know you can compare the facade of the convent masjid of Orhan with the uh, Kariye um, in Istanbul. Um, outlook is very similar. And then the rest of the building with the alternating brick and stone and brick patterning, uh, stone voussoirs and so on. These are all the details that we note in the local uh, Byzantine architectural practices, just like the Panto Vasilisa, uh, the detail from the Panto Vasilisa. And just a, as a point of comparison, you have the mosque of, or common masjid of Orhan over here with the sawtooth pattern. This is Panto Vasilisa again. Mm -hmm. So the similarities are very striking. And I think it is a very well-organized workshop. You see different integrated groups, perhaps coming from Syria, um, working in the um, workshop, um, uh, but also local um, uh, Greek uh, figures as well. Mm -hmm. and, and creating a very hybrid, mm -hmm. uh, semi-Byzantine uh, uh, building uh, on right. its outlook. Sure. It's fascinating. Um, well, believe it or not, it's uh, 7.30. <laughs> uh, and we promised uh, that we would take uh, questions. Uh, sure. Right now we have two, uh, well, one, uh, one question and one comment. So uh, I'll pause uh, to kind of um, read them out to you. Uh, sure. And then, uh, you know, ask uh, for uh, other questions. Uh, but if not, uh, we'll continue uh, <laughs> with a few more uh, uh, questions of our own. So uh, a question uh, that came uh, a little while ago uh, from Thomas Terzia. He asks, uh, does your research uh, or study comprise Mudanya and the surroundings as well? Uh, so this actually plays into our discussion of the, the harbors and the connection to the sea. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's a well put question, I think. Yeah. Um I mean, Mudania is visible in the um, context of Bursa in the, in the Roman period, because this is one of the cities that Bursa tries to establish sort of uh, solidarity to run up against Nicaea and Nicomedia. Um, and they try to establish a trade uh, in exchanging timber uh, from Bursa into Mudania, or in the ancient times as known as Apamea. Um, I work on the late Byzantine or middle Byzantine, uh, of course, I, I worked on those buildings um, in, in Mudania or on the southern shore of the Sea of Marmara. I studied the monastic remains, um, uh, city walls, fortifications, churches, and so on. Um, and Panto Vasilisa, although it's not in Mudania, it's very close to Mudania, it's in Trillia. And uh, it represents, I think, one of the most important buildings for our understanding of the early Ottoman architecture because it's a building that dates with the help of dendrochronology to 1336. And the mosque or con convent masjid of Orhan was built in 1339. So there is a quite a bit of overlap. Uh, there are striking similarities in the architecture. And I think, you know, the builders were, uh, you know, switching sides, working for different patrons in that time. And the southern shore of the Sea of Marmara, it's one of the regions that uh, the Ottomans conquered pretty late, uh, although they conquered much of Bithynia as early as the 14th century, early 14th century. Um, uh, places like Mudania, as well as uh, Trillia and uh, Gemlik, or Chios in, uh, in its ancient name, um, were uh, conquered in the late 15th century. For example, in Trillia, the first mosque that was com converted from a church uh, was in 1561. Uh, uh, the church of uh, 
Stephanos, Ayo Stephanos, um, ter, became uh, Fatih Jami um, in 1561. So despite the fact that the Ottomans were ruling here in the early 14th century and Bursa was their major capital city, um, much of the shore of the Sea of Marmara was under the control of the Byzantine rulership up until um, the you know, uh, mid uh, 15th century, late 15th century. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, we also have a comment uh, from Professor uh, uh, Rudy uh, Lindner, um, and it's more of a comment, uh, it's not a question, but uh, I thought it was interesting. He says, if you check VL Menage's dissertation, which is now available, he lists yeah. materials about Bursa that he feels came to Neshri from local informants, which is interesting. <laughs> uh, so uh, we'll make a note of that. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Yeah, I'll definitely. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, uh -huh. Another question we just got uh, from Charles Gates. <laughs> Um, he says, this is all fascinating. Uh, from my last visit to Bursa several years ago, I remember the archaeological museum as very sleepy, with little to say about the archaeological profile of the city. Could you comment on the current efforts to present the developments of the Hellenistic Roman Byzantine and early Ottoman city to the public? Or yeah. what might you suggest could be done? <laughs> That's a very good question. And uh, yeah, greetings to my former professor from Bilken. Um, it, it looks very really sleepy. The museum has been trying, I think in Wayne for many years to come up with new galleries displaying Hellenistic classical remains. Um, most of the artifacts or objects are on display in the garden. Most of the epigraphic remains, uh, some of the sculptures are in the gallery. Uh, they have been trying, but I think it's going to take a long while. But one of the exciting recent developments uh, taking place in Bursa is uh, being done by the Metropolitan Municipality. They are interested in doing a, an, an excavation in the old city. And uh, I, I have been part of that uh, scientific committee as well. Um, so I think uh, one of the ways perhaps to give an impetus to open up those galleries with uh, artifacts showing um, a classical and holistic remains uh, would be related to starting the excavations in the old city as well. I think the, the municipality is very um, excited about that uh, start. Uh, but yeah, uh, I mean, Bursa is a UNESCO protected city. Um, it has to have a better museum in order for us to go and see and understand the pre-Ottoman context of the city by looking at the galleries and the displays. Uh, but yeah, mm -hmm. it's gonna take a while, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we are happy to take more questions. We have about uh, 20 more minutes actually allocated to us. So uh, if you have questions, uh, please write them in the chat box. Uh, and while we wait for them, uh, I'm going to pose another question <laughs> to uh, Sunan. Uh, I want to ask you to comment on this uh, mysterious uh, Shehadet Jami uh, <laughs> within the walled city of uh, attributed to Murat the first um so of course it's been destroyed right in the in the 1855 earthquake um uh, but you say I, I guess based on this particular city view uh that it seems to have a double dome uh and based on that you suggest that it might have been the inverted uh, t type uh mm -hmm. plan um but you say perhaps with a friday mosque function um so uh, this, on the one hand, we have the type, the, t, the inverted T type that goes with the so-called convent masjid uh, function, uh, which we don't necessarily equate with Friday mosque. So, but of course, maybe we are too rigid. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what can you say about this shahadet? And, <laughs> and, and, it's, uh, and also, why is it called shahadet? Do we know? <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's probably not the original name, do you think? Or? Yeah, thank you so much. I must say you got me there because this mm. was the, one of the points that I couldn't really figure it out. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I would say, uh, but just using two depictions, uh, one by Lovinyam and another one by Kassa, I claimed or argue, I argued that, you know, the, the Shehadet 
might have had an inverted T plan originally. Um, the reason that I made that comparison, because the one that we see over here with the minaret and two domes is the shihadet. And then uh, the reason that I said it might be an inverted T, because uh, we see the uh, convent masjid of Orhan looking very similar in outlook uh, to that of shihadet right here. Two domes, although this is an inverted T with multiple domes um, and so on. Um, one more depiction, this one is by Kassa. Uh, this one doesn't show anything, only a single dome with a minaret. Um, and there has been so much uh, discussion, um, especially um, in the um, 1950s, 60s and 70s, uh, um, varying from scholars like Gabriel, uh, Kazem Baikal, Sedat Eldem and so on. They all um, discuss what kind of an original plan it might have. And there are several options, nine domed plan, inverted T, basilical, uh, the options are endless, I think. Um, the, uh, I, I mean, it, it is contradictory, as you said, um, having a Friday mosque with an inverted T plan, uh, but, um, and in order to answer your last question, um, I think it was built when Murat the first was alive, um, but then it was named Shehadet um, after he was uh, assassinated in 1389 in Kosovo. Mm -hmm. um, so it claims uh, for his uh, martyr identity or stands for his, uh, for his martyr identity, the mosque of martyrdom. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, the only thing, as I said, I'm basing my discussion uh, is the way that uh, uh, this comparison that I make with the, the way that uh, Convent Masjid of Orhan looks um, down below in the lower city. Um, uh, but, you know, um, it was an important addition to the old city, uh, perhaps um, um, adding up to its sacred um, qualities. Um, uh, um, a commission that's done by Murat the first and the way that you know it was situated across from where the palace was I think it also establishes another important connection within the old city and it's also important because it has the uh, the uh, the inscription uh, that is reportedly came from the first Friday mosque of Orhan um, mm -hmm. that was put on the walls uh, during the restoration Mm -hmm. 19th century. Mm. So in a way, the building is on its own very much layered, displaying different um, um, uh, snapshots within the Ottoman history mm -hmm. or the history of the city. Okay, we have, uh, well, just a, a, a technical question. Someone's asking if uh, it's okay to ask questions by voice. I mean, by uh, actually, no, we, we can only take questions from the chat box. So you'll have to write your question. <laughs> Um, and then we have another uh, little short question. Uh, uh, Miskin Akar uh, uh, wants to know if you can show the plan of the Ottoman palace place. I guess uh, um, I guess we, we know its location, but uh, we the don't palace. have that. Yeah, the palace. I guess you can show its location on the plan. I'm, I did have... You had a slide yeah. with that, didn't you? Uh -huh. Hold on. Let me just go back really quickly. It just takes ages. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah. did, did we just see it? Um. Yeah, I can, maybe I can use there. this one. Yeah, that one. Uh -huh. Yeah, this is the inner stada uh, within mm -hmm. the old city. And uh, this is now occupied by the military guest house, uh, sitting right on top of the remains of the inner stada here. And um, again, you know, um, in the middle Byzantine, late Byzantine cities, we have those inner stada uh, that is containing the palatial and administrative building, buildings for the city. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, in the survey, 
yeah, we found some remains of the towers as well as some uh, residential bits and pieces of residential complexes. But that's where we stand in terms of the in terms of the palace. Mm -hmm. I had one more really good, nice image making comparisons. Yes, this one. Uh, between the way that the old city looks with the palace over here and how it occupies a prominent place uh, within the or behind the walls of the city. And I just, as a point of comparison, I put uh, Kulich Arslan's pavilion from Konya and then how in the depiction of Kovel um, in 1670 in Ephesus, uh, we get a similar glimpse of the palace and the Friday mosque of the Aydinids uh, in the city. So mm -hmm. this visual uh, similarity, I find it very uh, striking uh, between right. the two cities as yeah. well. Okay. Um, actually, Amy has another <laughs> question for us. Uh, she says for Suna and Oya, um, but I'll let you take it. Uh, uh, she asks, could you reflect on what it meant to call Bursa a capital in the 14th century? Can you trace the Ottomans modeling of capitalness, what makes a capital, I guess, uh, on one or more precedents or neighboring regional examples? How can we relate this quote unquote capital uh, to others, I guess? Yeah. You just kind of actually touched on that with your, <laughs> when you showed, the, I also looked there. Yeah, um, I have one more um, comparative image and I'll just, go try to go to that one I don't remember where I put it mm. now I'll just try to find it I think it was in the second cluster of images just bear with me please Oh, I can't find them. No. Sorry. Okay. I'll try it one more time. And if I cannot find it, I'll just try to answer. Mm -hmm. I think it's a it's a very good question, the idea of capital, creating a capital or building a capital. And this is something that I have been thinking about. Um, um, again, comparing Bursa uh, with places like Ayasuluk, uh, the capital city or the major uh, city for the um, Aydinids and uh, Milet or Balat uh, for the Menteshets. Um, the way that, uh, you know, each principality uses uh, the ancient uh, fabric or Byzantine fabric in those cities is very similar. Um, in the in Miletus, for example, it just focuses on, on the theater hill uh, where there is a small stadel, and then they just move beyond the stadel very soon, just like Orhan, and then uh, they occupy the area of the Byzantine palace as well as the church of St. Saint Michael. And then we see further construction towards the end of the 14th century with um, Isaac Bey, I think. Isaac Bey, am I making a mistake here? The mentorship. Um, mm, you, I just had a blank too. Yeah. <laughs> but it's you know what I'm talking about. Yes. Ilyas, Ilyas, sorry. Ilyas Bey. Yes, Isa Bey, Ilyas Bey, Isaac Bey. Yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Aiden and uh, Manisa. Sorry about right. that. Um, so in a way, it's very similar. And then in Ayasuluk, um, again, the earliest attempts um, take place uh, where the Church of St. John is. They convert the building into a mosque. And then they go up to the stada where they construct the mosque, the palace, they reuse the cisterns, and so on. Um, so each city comes in with its own differences. But I think the idea of creating a capital city um, in this era was very much depended on uh, what was there in the cities that they conquered. And the other thing that I think we should remember is to see this administration in the 14th century as uh, being very polycentric. 
not just one center, but they had multiple centers. I mean, in the case of the Aydinets, uh, we have uh, places like Tire um, um, and, uh, and the Ayasuluk. And then for the Menteshits, uh, we have the Balat, uh, we have Pechin, and a couple of other Milas, other cities as well. And I think for the Ottomans, it was first Bursa, and then Nicaea came in, or Iznik came into the picture. Uh, when Edirne was conquered, Edirne was part of the picture. Um, so although I say I talk about the first Ottoman capital, I think the, the, our focus should be more on uh, seeing those cities as part of a larger network uh, each fulfilling different functions uh, for the rulership in that era. And we should just uh, try to understand the polycentric uh, administration. And this was something that we started seeing in the 13th century in the Crusader principalities um, in Cyprus, um, as well as in Moria. Um, so, um, and also I think with the Nicene Empire, uh, you know, with the Nymphaeon, Nicaea, and Magnesia uh, functioning and fulfilling different functions. Um, so I think there is no one, like there is no single capital in this era. There are multiple cities. Maybe Bursa was very important where we had the Sultanic um, commissions, uh, but in the other places that they conquered, uh, sultans built other structures as well, just like Murat the first building in Imarit um, in Iznik or Orhan building his uh, convent um, outside the walls of Nicaea. Mm -hmm. I hope I answered Amy's question, but yeah, this is how yes. my mind works right yeah. now. Sorry about um, that. Right, these, I think, uh, Western, uh, she says, great, thanks. So I guess <laughs> that uh, hit the mark. Um, we, we, we still have another eight minutes. Uh, we can take more questions. Uh, right now, we don't have any new questions. Uh, so, um, I kind of kind of skip over uh, Murat the first for a second uh, to maybe uh, ask another question about Bayezid the first mm -hmm. uh, and his projects uh, in uh, Bursa. Um, it's you know we can describe this as a kind of a turning point, uh, looking what comes before Bayezid the first and what he does. Um, and uh, you mentioned that uh, in his architecture, uh, where we no longer really see uh, the this kind of stone and brick Byzantine uh, uh, masonry, uh, but instead we see uh, uh, Ashler masonry, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, looks more uh, expensive <laughs> uh, and more fancy. Uh, and also, uh, of course, his uh, big project, uh, the, the the Grand Friday Mosque uh, that he builds in the, uh, the the district that Orhan uh, initiated, this what becomes a commercial uh, area. So uh, th this is a, a very distinct uh, turning point, it seems. Uh, but how? I mean, how how would you compare to what came before uh, with Orhan uh, and Murat the first? Uh, when we look at their projects, I mean, was Bayezid actually being really radical here? Uh, I mean, he's making things look different and more grand, uh, but uh, in some ways, actually, maybe was he conservative compared to his predecessors? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question and comment. Um, when we look at the architecture or the buildings that are commissioned by Orhan, we see both Byzantine and Mamluk elements. Uh, when we look at Murat the first, it's very Byzantine. Um, for example, in the convent masjid in Chikirge, um, most of the comparisons that we can get for that building are situated, um, uh, are the buildings that are coming from the Balkans, uh, from the Latinized Byzantine realms, and so on. So it's very Byzantine. When we come to um, Bayezid the first, it all changes, and I think it's a major shift um, in the in the aesthetics as well as the architectural taste. Um, and I I think the reason for that is um, related to the conquest that he was doing in the western part of Anatolia. Because this was, I think, the, the places in Anatolia, like Ephesus, uh, let's start with this one, Magnesia um, or Manisa, Isaac Celebi, 1378, a Saruhanid building. It, uh, it is 
Again, one of those hybrid buildings showing alternating brick and stone, but on the portals and decorative elements, you see great details about um, Memluk or Seljuk architecture. When we, so this is an example that predates the time of Bayezid. And then the Aydinid example coming from Ayasuluk, um, for which the major comparison is the Umayyad Great Mosque in Damascus. This is an Ashlar building again, uh, dating to the 1365, again, predating Bayezid. And I think, you know, Bayezid was, uh, maybe he found the examples that are, and I'm very speculative here, yeah. Uh, he found uh, he found the examples in Bursa to be archaic, mm -hmm. to be out of date. Mm -hmm. And in order to uh, run up against what was going on in Western Anatolia, the places that he was conquering by the 1390s, I think perhaps he was observing, and he he maybe he liked what he saw, and maybe he thought this was the way his architectural commissions should look like. Mm -hmm. So this is, again, as I said, I'm just speculating, but I think the, in the principalities, the Ashlar masonry comes into the picture earlier than the Ottomans, uh, a decade or two. And, uh, and the Ashlar masonry comes into picture in, in, the, uh, in the Ottoman architecture with the reign of Bayezid I, who is responsible for, the, for conquering those areas. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, I mean, as I said, uh, I'm just speculating, but I think he just found, found them archaic. And I think this is why um, for the convent masjid complex um, that he built in Bursa on the Eastern part of the city, his uh, convent masjid is totally made out of Ashlar, but the subsidiary structures are sort of recalling and you know making That's references right. to yeah. the alternating brick and stone. Um, so he's in a way very conscious, creating both archaic as well as contemporary feeling of the architectural scene in Anatolia. Yeah, actually, you know, that I, what you just said made me think of the Yeshiv complex, which is uh, beyond the scope of your uh, book and yes. discussion today, but there too, the, the main building of the complex uh, in the early 15th century yeah. uh, is, you know, uh, and, and the, the tomb. Uh, tower is uh, completely clad in tiles, but mm -hmm. then you turn to the madrasa <laughs> uh, yes. and you get that uh, quote unquote archaic uh, um, technique uh, being used probably quite deliberately. Yeah. Uh, that, that's interesting that that idea continues from Bayezid uh, through the interregnum <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, into the 15th century. Yeah. Okay, we have only two minutes, <laughs> so um, and no new questions. Uh, if anybody does have a very quick question, can type it really quickly. <laughs> I'm happy to read it out, um, but we should be wrapping it up. Um, so, Dear Professor, uh, maybe we can uh, end here uh, because it seems no questions so far. Um, if you wish, uh, we can just uh, wait just a little bit more. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, we just got a thank you note from Professor Lindner. <laughs> thank you Thanks for uh, thank listening. You so thank you to everyone uh, for uh, being with us uh, this evening. Yes. Um, and also thank you so much for this great talk, uh, dear Professor Chaptai and dear Professor Panjarolu. And also uh, I would like to thank our all attendees uh, for joining us. Um, this is uh, the last Anamed talk of this academic year and see you in September. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for everyone. Thank you. Thank okay. you, thank you and bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you so much. Bye-bye.